welcome to um, today's masterclass. Um, our topic is wildfires as a people problem and wildfires as a utility finance problem. Um, my name is Katie Kathleen Cernecka. I'm a program manager at the Precourt Institute for Energy. Um, and I'm just going to quickly introduce our, our speakers and then um, we'll take a quick gallery screenshot and then and then get started. Um, so today we have uh, with us Bruce Kane. He's a professor of political science and director of the Bill Lane Center for the American West. Um, he has a BA from Bowdoin College, a BPhil from Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar, and a PhD from Harvard. And his areas of expertise include political regulation, applied democratic theory, representation, and state politics. And then we also have Michael Wara with us. He's a lawyer focused on climate and energy policy, and he is the director of the Climate and Energy Policy Program and a senior research scholar at the Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment. And his legal and policy scholarship focuses on carbon pricing, energy innovation, and regulated industries. And he has a JD from Stanford and a PhD in ocean sciences from UC Santa Cruz. Um, so I will now hand it over to Bruce to share his screen. All right, um, so let's get started. Um, I'm happy to be here to talk about this topic and it couldn't be a more timely topic as you are here at the tail end of our most recent uh, set of fires. Uh, and I've titled this, it's not just a nature problem but also a people problem. So as we speak, we're finishing up this is from today's CAL FIRE site. Uh, the two pink areas here and here are the two fires that are closest to where we are. We're up here in Palo Alto and uh, the two fires are to the, uh, both the east and west of us. There are actually fires to the north of us as well. And according to Michael, that's what's generating a lot of the smoke. That's what he told us yesterday. <laughs> and it could be um, because uh, a lot of it depends upon which way the wind is blowing, but at any rate, these fires are almost 74% contained, which is why we still, you know, are not past the whole event, but it's pretty much getting close to being totally contained. And if you go to the site, you can get a list of all the fires uh, that uh, major fires in the state that uh, are still either still burning or the ones that have been put out completely. So it's, uh, and by the way, this is just the beginning of the season. And uh, for reasons I'll explain in a minute, the fires that we'll get later are the ones that in many ways are scarier because of the nature of the wind. So um, this is a social scientist explaining uh, science, so you want to take it with a grain of salt, but <laughs> I co-teach with uh, a number of uh, hydrologists and over the years I've learned about the very distinctiveness of the climate in the U.S. West. So I want to talk a little bit about that, talk about aridity, seasonality, aridity being the lack of precipitation and the high rates of evapotranspiration, seasonality being the fact that uh, we have periods, uh, long periods, months that go by without any precipitation and months where we do get precipitation, uh, which causes, out, causes the vegetation to grow and then dry out and become the source of uh, fires. We have a lot of variability across the years. Some years are very uh, wet years, some years are not so wet, we have the Diablo Santa Ana winds. And these produce three interrelated phenomena, the drought, uh, which you'll see in a second, the wildfires and the mudslides. The mudslides will come after the wildfires because uh, a denuded, if you like, denuded from vegetation uh, hillside can easily uh, develop into mudslides when we have heavy rains in the winter. And all this is gonna be exacerbated in ways by climate change. And that's not a topic I'm gonna be able to get into but we can certainly bring it up in Q&A if you'd like to. So you're in the West and the West is defined in many different ways, but the most frequent way it's defined and the way we do it for the purposes of the Bill Lane Center is to take the demarcation at the 100th Meridian, which was uh, basically the line that was defined by an expedition in the mid to late 19th century, which determined that the line of aridity, that is where the precipitation patterns changed dramatically started uh, somewhere along this line, the 100th meridian that goes from North Dakota down into Texas. So parts of Oklahoma, Texas, 
uh, Nebraska, San, uh, and North and South Dakota are all in the West. Parts are in, on the other side of the aridity line. But aside from the aridity and the evapotranspiration, that is the fact that uh, the heat in the, particularly in the Southwest causes a lot of the vegetation to dry out quite rapidly and thoroughly. We have the fact that we have distinctive seasonality. So here I've taken two uh, shots of the precipitation uh, and you can see that uh, in Sacramento, which is way here in, the, in California, you can see the precipitation is pretty much very minor to trivial from about May all the way to about October, okay? The, the, we, there's just not much rain. And those of you who grew up in the East or in other countries uh, will rec recognize that actually in the summer, there's often a lot of rain in the East. And here I took the other side, which is Oklahoma City, which is just on the other side of the 100th meridian. Although, by the way, now people believe that the that the line of precipitation really starts at the 98th uh, meridian. So we'll see how that pattern changes in Oklahoma City. But you can see the precipitation in the summer is still pretty heavy, quite heavy in um, even in Oklahoma, let alone on the East Coast. So it's the seasonality that is extremely distinctive of the Western climate. Uh, we also have a lot of year-to-year -year variation in precipitation. So uh, you can see the darker colors represent where the ratio of the, the if you like, the variance or standard deviation of precipitation uh, is highest. Um, and uh, you can see that that's particularly true as you get into the Southwest. Uh, those are areas down there, San Diego, Imperial County, uh, which rely very heavily on water from the Colorado River. Now, what this produces, of course, is a pattern of droughts. Uh, and this is one drought index uh, that, uh, you, that you can find. Uh, and uh, the severity of the drought ranges from sort of just dry periods, uh, that, that's the yellow, to the uh, exceptional drought. And you can see that just recently in 2011-12, we started the drought. And then for a period between 2012 and 2017, substantial parts of the state, so the, the fraction of the state is on the vertical, as, uh, access and on the horizontal is the year, you can see that for a period of about four or five years, substantial parts of the state were at least in serious drought. And uh, particularly when you got to 2015 and 16, we had really, really, really serious drought. Uh, and that produced the potential for the wildfires that we got in 2017 and 18, okay? Um, there's other things that have created the fuel, namely the suppression policies that the Forest Service and um, the era when I was growing up, Smokey the Bear era, if you like, <clears throat> that has also contributed, but we'll get into that if, if somebody wants to know. The last uh, and distinctive feature that those of you from the East Coast would not be familiar with is this, this one about the Diablo winds as we call them up here in Northern California or the Santa Ana winds. And they're basically winds that come in off the desert and then uh, through the compression of going up and down through uh, the, the sort of uh, uh, hills and valleys of, and mountains, uh, coastal ranges uh, of uh, California, they, they, they pick up speed and they pick up uh, 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 warming and a drying. And that's what we really had uh, trouble with in 2017-18 not so much in this most recent, uh, in fact, not at all. We didn't have Diablo winds. Uh, the winds for the most part were more north-south. Uh, and I don't think we really had focused as much on the dry lightning problem. Uh, it, we certainly have always had dry lightning, uh, but it was more out into the uh, remote areas. What was exceptional about this storm was the number of the dry lightning hits and also the fact that they occurred in these urban areas where we had not had many fires before. And uh, so the dry lightning is particularly problematic. If you follow this chart, this shows you the number of strikes, just an incredible 9,000 strikes practically. And you can see the yellow ones are the ones, are the continuous lightning strikes. Something I had never really thought about, but I looked it up and apparently there's a lot of different types of uh, lightning, but the continuous current ones are the ones that really start the fires because they have the longer contact with the ground between the ground and the clouds and, uh, and the electrical current. And that uh, tends to generate more heat and cause more of the fires. So it was not just the number of these strikes, but it was the nature of the strikes as well. And as I said, 
the accumulation of the fuel that had happened both over the years and uh, as a result of uh, recent variation in between precipitation and dry years. So, but I'm a social scientist. I want to focus more on the people problem because while it's true that this is getting worse because of climate change, the reality is that wildfires have a long, deep history with humans in the American West. This is not a new problem. It was when I moved, I uh, took a job at Caltech in 1976. Uh, we dealt with wildfires all the time down in California. I remember the hills burning quite frequently. So I want to say that this is a people problem, not just a nature problem. And a lot of it has to do with the increasing population in areas that we know to be prone to wildfires, which are uh, called wooey areas, wild, uh, wild land urban interface areas. And basically the presence of people causes wildfires, okay? Um, I'll do these two points fairly quickly, but then I want to spend a lot more time on what the hell's going on with people's decision making and how does that make it worse. So um, you can study this map. I'm going to leave the slides have been posted and you can take a look at it, but the dark colors indicate where people are living very close to areas that uh, or types of vegetation that are likely to catch fire. And so there are basically two different types of interfacing. One is to be close to a national forest or uh, an area that potentially could burn. And so when I was living in Southern California, Altadena is a good example of that. That's where JPL is. Altadena uh, is literally abuts the, the, uh, the forest uh, that goes up to uh, the mountains. And uh, people that live there have to ex experience the terror of the, of the fires on the hills. But the kinds of fires that, uh, the other kind of fires that we see a lot in Northern California is, are communities like, if you wanna just see it, just go up into the Santa Cruz Hills here, just go up and see, uh, you know, Portola Valley, uh, places like that, Woodside. And you can see communities that are very much embedded in uh, the vegetation. Uh, and they're, basically what the fire marshals will tell you is those, those people are very much exposed to um, these fire risks uh, and uh, you know it, it just there happens to be a retirement home up <laughs> up in that area behind us and uh, they've been briefed by the fire department they've been told that if, if indeed a fire did start up in those hills very few of the residents of that retirement home many of whom are Stanford former Stanford professors would basically not be able to escape and would be incinerated, much as what happened in paradise. Now, that's not the only area. I mean, you can go around the West and you can see the same kind of interspersing. Again, the dark red are the areas which is uh, most likely to be affected by uh, these, um, these fires because they're intermingling uh, between the, uh, the vegetation and the, uh, and, and, and the development, the urban and suburban development. And these areas have continued to grow in population. This is a, just an example of all these Western states are still growing. In California, we have a housing shortage. The governor wants to build more housing. It's not easy for people your age and uh, you know maybe 10 to 15 years older to buy a home. It's extremely expensive. So there's a lot of pressure to build new homes. But where are you going to build those new homes? Well, people want to build them in areas that are pretty and beautiful which means they wanna be closer to nature, which means they wanna be closer to danger. And so uh, the coincidence of what people want in terms of the demand of housing, combined with the fiscal incentives that urban areas have to build more housing, because that generates more revenue that pays for services, means that people are making riskier and riskier decisions every year, right? Uh, so you can study these statistics a little bit more closely on your own, but basically a lot, 43% of the new homes are built in these wooey areas, okay? Uh, so we're continuing to make the same mistake. Just as the wooey areas continue to expand because of the drying and the climate change, the reality is that we're continuing to build in these areas, okay? And when we do the polling on this, we find that this is what people want. People say, hey, if somebody wants to go live in a risky area, that's on them. It's not on us. As Mike will point out, actually, it is on us, all of us, because of the fiscal implications, but I will leave him to explain that to you, okay? 
So let me talk about their flawed decisions and then finish. Okay, so people make a lot of very flawed decision making. First of all and foremost, and this is the one that I think we really need to attack, people are rebuilding in areas that have previously had fires. And I think the idea is that lightning can't strike twice in the same place or something, and that's simply not true. So this is up in the Napa area and all these colored areas and you can see the various decades that are in the, uh, in the um, box there. These are all fires that occurred in previous decades. And yet now we've continued to rebuild in those areas. Okay. So we keep rebuilding in the same damn places. Okay. Now, why do we do it? Well, we do it because a lot of people underestimate the damage. They think to themselves, well, what are the odds that that fire is going to uh, affect me, or maybe they think, oh, it doesn't matter. I'll get out of there and I will pay my insurance and I'll just rebuild. Or they think, um, well, with new materials and vegetation management, I'll, I'll decrease the risk of fire damage to myself. And that's true to some extent. Uh, but all of it still underestimates both the social and individual dangers that people face. So one of the reasons people decide to do it is they think, well, I can with new building materials, I can harden my home with uh, various vegetation management strategies, I can create a defensible space. And if we do more prescriptive burns, we can take care of the outlying areas. And all of those things are true, but it doesn't eliminate the risk that you will still lose your property, that you will still put your life at risk. So you can make all these wonderful choices about what kind of shingles to have. You can replace the wood with fiber cement board. You can treat the windows differently. You can make sure that the eaves and, uh, and, the, and the deck are taken care of in various ways uh, to, to uh, be more resistant to flames. But you got to remember that it, there are all kinds of little things that you can do that will, particularly if we get one of these Santa Ana winds or uh, Diablo winds that bring in lots of sparks that are traveling at 50 or 60 miles an hour and beating up against your home, you leave your garage door open or you leave gaps in various places. Uh, this is, I believe, why there was a warehouse, as I recall, in Santa Rosa that burned largely because somebody left the door open. Okay, so <laughs> number one, when you're fleeing, you may not remember to do everything you're supposed to do. But um, the reality is that no matter what you do, there are some fires that are going to burn so hot, no matter what, you're going to uh, be incinerated. So we try, and I, again, I'm not saying that it isn't worth doing these things because this is our second best strategy, because no matter what we do, people are going to continue to want to live in these wooey areas. So, uh, you know, we're, a lot of us are spending time thinking about, well, what do we do not only to figure out what in terms of evidence base is the best way to do fuel management and vegetation management, but also how do you enforce any regulations? How do you make sure that people are doing what they're supposed to be doing? Um, the good example, which I'm going to let uh, um, Michael explain if he wants to, is that Mill Valley put a fairly modest uh, proposal forward on hardscaping of property. And uh, people, and he, he has many more stories about the insanity of it all, but <laughs> this is one of the ads that Rebecca Miller, one of my graduate students, uh, uh, focuses on in her lecture on this topic. And, and basically people were saying, well, which place would you rather live in? You'd rather live in the place that has that vegetation all around. It's much more appealing, much more inviting, <laughs> but the safer one is the one that uh, doesn't have all that. And so people make these decisions about their lives and their property on, I don't want to call them irrational, but they, they refuse to see the importance of safety uh, and uh, tend to make choices which, uh, should we say, are problematic. Uh, not to mention the fact that, you know, really when you put in new regulations, most of it applies to new construction. Uh, so if you go into San, uh, Santa Rosa, as we did in our class, and you look at the houses that are being rebuilt, you realize that there's, a, there's going to be a scattering back in the community that burned between some houses that survived no matter what, that are going to have the same old vegetation, the same old construction materials next to homes that were, will be built up to code. So um, not to mention the fact none of them will have 100 feet uh, of defensible space between them. So 
One thing that I want to say is that we do believe that quite possibly the smoke may be a wake-up call for us. Uh, and I, the parallels are to secondhand smoke with respect to tobacco. And here is a poll that we did. Uh, and you can see the level of concern with wildfires after 2017-18 was very high uh, in California. And that uh, basically um, people had read about fires, uh, over 50% had read about fires throughout the state and close uh, over 50% had experienced some degree of smoke or knew themselves or new family members, that's the personal one, who had actually been involved in the fire. So the reason, um, and you can see by the way, that the, the smoke travels throughout the West. Uh, at one of our sophomore colleges, we were out in Utah uh, around the time that the fire smoke from California was uh, polluting the air in Utah. So. It has a, the political advantage that it brings people in to the discussion who might not otherwise be afraid of the fire itself. Um, the other way that risk is, uh, is underestimated is with respect to insurance. I won't spend a lot of time on it, but people systematically in Santa Rosa did not buy the right level of insurance, partly because of the surge prices, but partly just they, they just didn't have the right kind of coverage. And that creates a real problem for the community trying to rebuild. So let me finish lastly with partisanship, which is a big topic in political science. Um, you'd like to think that Democrats and Republicans see the reality, but the partisanship in this country is so great that e in a variety of these extreme weather circumstances, whether we're talking about drought, heat, and in this case, wildfires, Democrats are much more likely to acknowledge the same extreme weather that they experience with the Republicans, <laughs> okay? So there is a partisan screen that seems to be working even on the experience of extreme weather. And uh, one of the things we've done is we've tried to test, well, uh, what, what if we actually take into account uh, the real experiences of people, does that close the gap in terms of these uh, subjective biases? And this is an example where we took in, uh, the actual measurement of how close you were to the smoke or how, how many fires you actually saw over a period of time. You can see the error bars as you get out to the extreme are very, very wide. So you don't really only want to look at the first part of the, uh, of the graph, but you can see that while these biases exist, there is no question that experience even erodes the, uh, uh, the unwillingness of Republicans to recognize that there are real serious extreme weather and climate change problems. It does so, it, it takes more experience to change their views, but they are witnessing it. So let me just finish by saying we have as much a people problem as we have a nature problem. That is to say, when we deal with this problem, we have to, if we're going to live resiliently in the West, we have to, we have to be aware of the wildfire risk and we have to adapt ourselves so that we can live there in a way which is safer and does not impose the serious social costs that these recent wildfires have. We can't sustain that for very long. Okay, I'll hand it over to Michael. Uh uh, we have uh, two two questions, um, uh, one from Pratik and one from Benjamin. Um, do we want to do questions now or do you want to wait until... Then? I think to be fair to Michael, uh, we should just go ahead with Michael and just I, save those questions. And, I was uh, going to say, actually, Bruce, it's fine with me if we take these questions now because they're pretty, they're pretty focused on what you just spoke about and it'd be better to just talk about it. It's okay. okay. I don't mind. All right. you. Okay. It's your call, Mike. Okay. Uh, Pratik, you want to go first? Sure. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. And I was just wondering, I heard about this wildfire buffer zone that um, Paradise is thinking of building, and I'm sure you've maybe heard about it as well. Um, I'm just wondering what you thought about, you know, the effectiveness of that solution. I think it's, they're calling it like a green belt to essentially surround the whole town with, you know, defensible space. So I didn't know if you thought that was a, you know, an effective way to go about adaptation or if that was just, you know, people still insisting on staying put. Um, 
Well, Alex. I'll give an answer and Michael, uh, feel free to jump in as well. Uh, Mike was on the governor's commission and uh, is quite knowledgeable about all these things. I would say it depends upon what the word effective means. If you mean by effective, which I think you do, it lowers the risk, then yes, just as all the defensible space measures and the home hardening measures lower the risk, yes. Does it mean it eliminates the risk that you will burn? The answer is no, particularly when you get these fires that have the winds behind them and they're blowing a torrent, <laughs> a virtual river, 60 miles an hour of sparks that are hitting these homes. And when we were up in Santa Rosa and talking to the Stanford people that live up there, they were questioning what the insurance companies and the, uh, and the uh, regula regulatory authorities were telling them to do because they were saying, well, hey, if we have indoor sprinklers and we maintain the 100 feet, or in this case, a zone, what happens if you get these fires that are you know, coming with sparks at 60 miles an hour and are beating onto uh, our property? Are, is the indoor sprinkler system really going to work? And the answer is, first of all, I doubt that anybody's I, there are people doing the science on this. Uh, I don't know whether the insurance companies are listening to those people or they're doing industry science, but I can tell you for sure that everything I've read is that there's no guarantee when you get certain conditions in this, the kind of heat and uh, wildfire storms that we have seen recently that, that any of these measures will give you a 100% guarantee. You know, there's a great meta, there's a great example of this from another part of the country. After Hurricane Andrew, uh, Florida instituted new building codes for roofing to keep the roofs on the house. It's a big source of damage in hurricanes is, the, is that the wind will blow the top off the house and then the water gets in. And so these so-called super roofs protect structures in hurricanes from up to like a cat three hurricane. But if it's a cat four or a cat five, all bets are off. And I think that's a great way to think about, you know, we don't have categories of wildfire, but, but things like what Paradise is proposing will protect Paradise from a Cat 1 or a Cat 2 or a Cat 3 wildfire, but not what happened in 2018. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. We should have a category system for wildfires. <laughs> All right, what's the second question? <laughs> uh, Benjamin, you want to ask your question? Hi, yes. Um, my name is Ben. I'm an uh, MBA one um, at the GSB. Um, I was curious, you um, mentioned, um, and we'll sort of discuss at length, um, the issue of developing um, residences or just developing generally in um, WUIs. And I was just curious, you know, what, I know this is probably a question that folks have been trying to solve for a long time and there might not be a simple answer, but how do you solve for a housing crisis how do you solve for population growth throughout the West while doing so safely with regard to wildfires? Like, are there any existing urban areas that, you know, are wildfire safe or maybe you could you know, push past the, the nimbyism and try to encourage densification? Um, well, it's a constant battle to push against the nimbyism. And in fact, we're going to do an environmental governance class in the spring on precisely that. And I do think housing and land use are absolutely critical issues. And, and the state doesn't really have control over that because of the nature of local government having sovereignty over a lot of these issues and having fiscal incentives as a result of things that have to do with property tax um, and the need to sort of fiscalize land use in order to generate revenues. Uh, that accounts for why developers are extremely powerful in the cities. So. Uh, you know, we have made progress in getting communities to be more fire aware and to take certain steps, but it is a struggle because it's not unlike the COVID thing where there's what you can do <laughs> to maximize your chances of not getting sick. And then there's the economic consequences of those measures. And there's a similar kind of trade-off with respect to uh, the cities as they think about housing, because if, if they can get affluent people to buy beautiful homes in the middle of Woodside. By the way, uh, I will point out that Stanford is planning to put a housing project in Woodside and the people in Woodside are concerned about that. 
um, for a variety of reasons. So we, we're continuing to do it too. People want to live in these beautiful areas surrounded by vegetation, but okay. Uh, I point to a Mill Valley as an example uh, of a community that didn't want to do it. Michael, you want to tell them a couple horror stories? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I just say, you know, I think you're, you're pointing at an issue that, that gets so deep politics in California. Um, right. And, and it also gets to the economics of housing development because of that politics. So it costs a lot to build a structure in California. A lot of that is regulatory cost associated with all kinds of different things, most of which are well-intentioned. But what that means is that if you can amortize your regulatory costs over larger numbers of structures, of, 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 of units, it's a much more profitable enterprise. And that's also part of what drives the big developers out of the city because they can get big plots of land build 2,000 houses instead of building one building. And they, they can amortize their regulatory costs and risks over a larger number of units. Um, and so there's really like, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very complicated problem um, and one that California is struggling to resolve effectively. And the status quo is we build in the WUI um, or more of our units get built in the WUI. So right. it's, you know, look outside Palo Alto, Mill Valley is a great example. Palo Alto is notorious for limiting development. Um, there are all kinds of communities in the inner Bay area that, that really need to change in order to solve this problem of, that, of, of avoiding risk, avoiding putting new homes in Hotsua. Yeah, what Michael means is Palo Alto resists having high density homes uh, and uh, Mill Valley. And so a lot of communities just allow the expansion on the, in the zones. Right, that's what you meant, right? Exactly. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Um, Thank you both. Shall we shift gears and talk about utilities? Yep. Are there more questions about Bruce's? Okay. So, um, you know, when I started out working on this issue of wildfire and electric utilities, um, I had a particular idea of what a utility was, but I think you know it's it's sort of like I was trying to think of examples of things that just sort of work and you don't really know what they are until they break. And, you know, one example that comes to mind for me is like a toilet, right? You just push the button, the bad stuff goes away. You know that like gravity is involved, maybe some water pressure, but you don't have to like know anything about it until it breaks. And then you lift up the lid and there's this like Rube Goldberg contraption in the tank that somehow is doing the things and, 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 and there's a lot more there. There's a lot of complexity. There are many things in life we don't understand that are essential kind of until they don't work anymore. And I think the crisis that's occurred in California over the last several years, particularly with Pacific Gas and Electric, but definitely not limited to PG&E, the utility in Northern California, um, is a great way to learn about like, what is it that make you makes utilities tick? It's like, what is a utility? And I'd ask all of you, like, what do you think, what is the most fundamental essence of a utility, whether it's an electric utility or a water utility or a gas utility, what, what, what's it doing that makes it special? That's the reason we call it a utility. Does anyone have a thought about that? Feel free to unmute and just jump in. Well, it's a company that's providing um, goods that society has decided that people need over a service territory because if, if you had two companies doing the same thing, it's not economically viable for competition, so. Okay, so um, I just wanna get your name, Fletcher, is that correct? Fletcher's, Fletcher sort of has two answers. And I, 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 one is, it's something people need. Right? It's an essential good. And I think it's fair to say that things like electricity and water and sewer and gas are, are essential, essential needs. Maybe, maybe gas is, we're, we're trying to shuffle that to the, the shadows in California, but it's still something that people need, need for, to, to live in a modern way. Um, he also makes the point that it's a, it's a monopoly. We don't want two companies providing a lot of these goods. And, and that's another important clue, right? A lot of the utilities that we think about are network industries where we don't wanna, we've decided that we don't wanna build two networks. And so unlike for many other types of companies, 
we actually give them an, an, an exception, a pass on being a monopoly, right? You're not allowed to be a monopoly in most areas of, of, of business. Um, but, but, um, certainly like, um, for, for utilities, that's kind of, that's an important defining element of what a utility is. They get an exemption from antitrust law in the United States. So they're allowed to, in fact, they're supposed to monopolize. And if anyone tries to compete with them, they'll go straight to their regulator and, um, and start, start trying to shut that person down. Um, does anyone other, ha have other thoughts about what a, what a utility is? I want to share them. What, what makes a utility a utility? Um, looks like we have a, a response in the chat here. Oh, great. Okay, sure. Um, a service that allows us to do things. It's useful. Yeah, I think that's another important way to think about this. Like a utility enables all these other activities, right? It's so fundamental to, to kind of how we live our lives that it, it enables all the other activities that we want to pursue, whether they're economic or, um, you know, purely for, for, for pleasure. Um, you know, Netflix doesn't work, right, without electricity, and it doesn't work without um, some sort of broadband internet service. That's kind of another sort of utility. Um, so, so a utility is a business that provides us essential good, and it's generally a monopoly, although not always. There, there can be some competition. Um, I'm going to provide another, I'm going I'm to inject another element into this. You know, we want to have these businesses providing us these essential goods at minimum cost. Right, we, we wanna to try to see, and usually, how do we get to lower cost? What's the what's a way to lower costs in, it, in an industry? Competition. Yeah, competition, exactly. You get, you get a bunch of companies fighting for market share and they, they reduce costs by competing with each other, by lowering prices to attract customers. But since we've decided that we don't wanna have multiple sets of poles and wires and pipes and all that across the landscape, right? We have to find another way. Um, and so um, this, this gets to, you know, utilities are going to have to operate differently. And um, I would just say, I'm going to add one final dimension to this. And I think this is fundamental, but this is the one that's not obvious. This is the one that like kind of requires lifting up the hood to look underneath. Um, another element of what a utility does is create a mechanism for very cheap finance for long lived infrastructure, right? So, so the thing about the poles and wires and the pipes and all of that is that it, it lasts a long time, right? It's stuff that is supposed to last 30 years, maybe, maybe 40, sometimes if you're talking about gas infrastructure, natural gas infrastructure, 60 years. And so it is financed over very long time scales, right? So the, the loans and the investments that are being made are paid off essentially by customers over long timeframes. And in order to do that inexpensively, right, you have to have a mechanism that creates a lot of certainty for the, for the bank, right, for the, for the person that's gonna loan the money. They need to believe that this company is going to be around in 40 years that it won't default on its essentially on its mortgage right on its bonds it, it, for those of you who are more financially oriented but it you know we need to have a lot of confidence that bankruptcy won't occur that the customers won't go away right the customers won't find a better way to do whatever the company does and a lot of that desire for certainty is actually what drove and 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 certainty in order to reduce financing costs in order to make costs lower for customers is what drove the creation of regulated utility industries in the United States. The utilities themselves actually sought regulation. They went to the states and said, pass laws to regulate us so that they could lower, they could increase the, the, their creditworthiness, the confidence of banks to loan them money. And so lower their financing costs, the interest rate they pay on their loans which the interest rate you know, matters a lot. You guys probably are not in a position to buy homes right now, but if you can go from a 6% rate to a 3% rate, that may not sound like a lot, but over 30 years, it makes a tremendous difference in terms of the overall cost of building something. Um, so 
all of these answers are right. None of them are wrong, right? Utilities provide essential services. They create, um, they create um, infrastructure that we need without competition, right? And that's, that's mostly intended. And they, but, and they all, but they also are structured in a way to reduce risk, right? To be sure that the monopolization, the kind of lock-in that's created, the, regu the regulatory oversight that occurs lowers risk, or it's supposed to. Um, so I wanna ask a, a related question is, what's a utility's role in the energy transition? So what I mean by the energy transition is, you know, building in, in California, what it has meant over the last decade or so is a radical transformation of generation. Right, so we used to depend on coal and natural gas and hydro, and now we depend on a lot less natural gas, still the hydro, but a lot of wind and solar. How have we, what is the utility's role in building that wind and solar? Does anybody know? Does anybody, it's, it's, it's okay if you don't. This is, this is more subtle, but it, it relates to that credit worthiness as well. Create a market, right? You have a buyer for a new form of energy. Yeah, they're the buyer, exactly. And what renewable portfolio standards, like the one that California has, which is really where a lot of the reductions in emissions for California have come from, what they do is force the utilities to buy power from these new um, you know, clean energy providers. Picture a big 700 megawatt solar utility scale solar power plant, say in the Central Valley of California or in the Mojave Desert. Um, the utilities role is, is as a buyer. The form that that purchase takes is like a 20 year contract called a power purchase agreement, right? Now, why sign, you know, the, the value of that contract, right? Is that it turns a solar farm into a solar power plant into like a cash generating machine and a cash generating machine with very low risk, right? Once the plant is built, then the, the person that is, that owns it knows they have a guarantee that they can sell power to a utility for 20 years and long enough to pay off what? What is, what is the, what is the, probably the, what does the solar power provider have to do? in order to construct a solar farm? Do you think they have money in the bank or are they doing something else to actually purchase all of those panels and pay all of the workers to do the grading of the land and all of that and install the panels and interconnect it to the grid? We've got uh, Alessandra said, said loans in the- Loans, yeah, that's right. You know, the, they need to convince a bank to loan them the money. And you know what's a great way to convince a bank to loan, some, loan, loan you money? If you show up at the bank with a signed power purchase agreement for 20 years for all of the output from your solar power plant with someone who is not gonna go bankrupt, but that the bank can say, oh, you, you contracted with, um, you know, with, with, with a company that we think under no circumstances will default on its obligations, which is what bankruptcy is. Bankruptcy means you can't fulfill all of your financial obligations, including contracts to, to purchase things. Um, and so in California, and actually really around the country, utilities are incredibly important because they're, a, they're the low risk buyer that allows for the finance of these power plants. You can't build large power plants like this. You can't get loans anyway to build large power plants um, without a, an offtake agreement like this under most circumstances because they're incredibly capital intensive and the, the economics of them don't make sense without the ability to borrow at low cost. So what, why is this all important? Well, this is, you know, the strategy for California decarbonization is basically clean up the electricity sector, which means sign a lot of power purchase agreements between utilities and new renewable generators, 
electrify buildings and electrify transport. That is the roadmap to deep decarbonization in California. So when wildfires in 2017 and 2018 were caused by utilities um, and, the, and, and, and the fires were, did enough damage to put utilities into risk of bankruptcy, it basically broke this chain, right? Because the first, the first link in the chain is an agreement between a company that, will, that banks can be sure will purchase the good being produced, electric energy, right? For a very long period of time at an agreed upon cost. And anyone else in that chain that might help to create that reality of a giant solar power plant, say in the Westlands Water District in the Central Valley. And so many of us got interested in this problem. We had never really lifted up the hood on a utility, you never really thought about the relationship between the utility balance sheet and the ability to build new solar under the requirements of the RPS until all of a sudden, the balance sheets of the utilities had to take on this new liability, the obligation to pay for the damages caused by wildfire. So, um, and I should just say, I just talked about this. The, you know, the utilities in California have a very special role. And, and I think it's worth noting also that the California targets for decarbonization put utilities like PG&E kind of in a, a leadership role in the United States, right? Just to, just to cite one number that's rather striking. 25% of the rooftop solar in the country is in PG&E service territory. 50% of the rooftop solar is in California. Half of that is PG&E. So, you know, California utilities are way out ahead of pretty much anyone else in the country. And they work, they have traditionally worked hand in hand with the state to try to achieve California's targets, which essentially push the ball forward on climate policy at the national level. Um, so what happened? What went wrong? Um, Bruce mentioned and showed some pictures of Santa Rosa um, and, and of the Napa fire that occurred in 2017. But in October 2017, we had you know, historically unusual conditions that led to utility power lines starting enormous numbers of fires in Napa and Sonoma counties to the north of Stanford. And um, this was combined with a legal regime in California that's longstanding that basically says, if utility, start, if utility power lines start fires, the utility has to pay for the damages. There's no question of negligence. It's a strict liability regime. It's called inverse condemnation. But the basic idea is that utilities are able to socialize the costs of accidents that occur due to utility infrastructure over their entire rate base. And so um, they should be, it's a, it's a sort of efficient way to get those damages paid for. Um, the problem that occurred in 2017 was that there was real uncertainty about whether the utilities could actually charge customers for the damages caused. They were so large. You know, the 2017 fires caused about um, $10 billion in insured losses. And um, that's such a big number in terms of how much money, how much the revenues of PG&E in particular, that it seemed implausible that the utility commission would allow those charges to be passed through in rates. Then in just a year later, the campfire was caused by age, by ancient, I would say, transmission infrastructure uh, up in Butte County that, and, and Bruce mentioned the consequences, you know, and I'm sure you're all familiar with what happened in Paradise. Shortly after that fire, um, PG&E was essentially cut off from all access to credit, not just these long-term loans, but even short-term lending, like, and, um, and shortly thereafter, they had to declare bankruptcy because utilities are really dependent, even just for doing the kind of routine maintenance, like if a pole falls over or there are woodpeckers in it and they need to replace it, right? That pole is the capital expense of replacing that pole is financed with bonds and issuance of new shares, new, new shares in the utility company. And so once bond investors said, no more, we're not buying any more PG&E debt because we don't know if we're gonna wake up in, 
fall of 2019 and PG&E will have burned down more of California, right? And once um, equity investors, shareholders decided that they didn't want to own PG&E and that happened very rapidly. Um, the share price in October of 2017, just prior to the fires was $70. By December of 2018, the shares were trading at less than $10. Um, and um, basically all of the kind of normal investors in utility shares had gotten out. Um, but once that happens, the utility basically has cash on hand and they have to try to maintain this very expensive and um, distributed system of poles and wires with the cash that's coming in and that's just not possible. They need to be able to issue long-term debt and shares. So in January, the utility declared bankruptcy and the key question was, how do we reassure these folks that are the kind of crucial source of finance to, um, to utilities that, that, that provide the, the source of demand for utility bonds and utility shares that they should invest in California, right? When California utilities are causing tens of billions of dollars of damage that they are strictly liable for, um, every it's seemingly every fall or at least two falls in a row and the solution was to create an insurance fund well the, the solution was multifaceted um, and i'm gonna talk but but the financial solution was to create um, an insurance fund that provides much greater certainty um, for the utilities in terms of um, their ability to recover costs on fire um, so and, and the fund was created as a part of this, this legislation, 1054, AB 1054, that did a whole bunch of other things that basically try to reduce, are aimed at reducing the risks that the insurance will actually be needed. So there's sort of a combination, reduce the physical risk and then create a mechanism so that the utility, it becomes low risk again um, and can be that source of certainty at the heart of this very long lived infrastructure that we want to build as inexpensively as possible. And that would really without the creation of the wildfire fund, not only would PG&E not have been able to exit bankruptcy, but Edison, the Southern California, the two major Southern California utilities, Southern California Edison and San Diego Gas and Electric would now not have investment grade credit ratings. Um, so it was a very important kind of risk reduction measure. So the, so the fundamental steps were better management of the physical risk, right? Reducing the chance that the utilities catch fire, but also better management of the financial risk um, so that there was greater certainty that, um, that the, the, the utility investors could have in, in investing in California, essentially, taking a long-term bet on California. The challenge moving forward is going to be better management of the political risks, because you may have heard, and you'll probably experience this fall, or you may experience this fall, the situation where, you know, the best, one of the best physical risk management strategies, right, the best way to reduce fire risks during dangerous times is actually just to turn off the power right now. And that creates enormous political blowback. Um, and, you know, obviously the governor and the commission really do not want to see power turned off. And so there's this tension between minimizing physical risk, minimizing the chance that PG&E will burn down another community and the political risk, minimizing the chance that PG&E has an acceptable relationship with the state that regulates it. And both of those are strongly connected to the financial risk. So, um, I think there are hopeful paths forward, um, but it's, it's a very narrow path. And it's gonna be very interesting to see whether PG&E can actually navigate this um, as, we, as we move through this year and the next several years.